important. My name is Dr. Sonia Bourdin Aykroyd. I am a dentist. Uh, I'm the founder and owner of the American Academy and the International Laser Academy of Orofacial Harmony. And the, uh, the owner of the Visage Wellness Institute in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Today, I have the honor to host Dr. Ayman Zagal. He's an oral and craniofacial surgeon from Jerusalem, a researcher in the field of virtual surgical planning and 3D printing, and a key opinion leader for Tree Shape and guided implantology in Palestine. Dr. Zagal graduated from Miser University of Science and Technology in Egypt. He did his postgraduate residence in buccomaxillofacial surgery and um, his national board exam in the US, which he passed successfully. And he did, his residence is from Nasser Institute and Research and Buccomaxillofacial Surgery in Cairo, Egypt. Dr. Zagal was the first to present a new anatomical discovery at the International College of Maxillofacial Surgery in Palestine. He's board certified by both the Arabic and the Egyptian board, dental boards. Dr. Zagal is a person of research and innovation in the field of virtual surgical planning and 3D printing. He is an icon of digital dentistry in Palestine with various publications in the field. Dr. Zagal will talk today about a new approach for virtual planning and mandibular reconstruction, utilizing occipital crest as a native midline landmark, and will present his success story of his innovative technique. Before we start, let me say a word. This podinar will be streamed live here. And at the end, anyone watching can register uh, via the link uh, in the comments in the thread to go to get some CE credits. Um, please place your question in the chat in the Facebook live chat, and we'll be able we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Now. Let's welcome Dr. Zagal. And Dr. Zagal, the floor is yours. Good morning, Sonia. Good morning, everyone. Here is uh, the Holy Land, Jerusalem. It's 5 p.m. after uh, after midday. So it's a good morning and a good afternoon. I, I don't know. Uh, I hope that you wake up uh, with a beautiful day. So uh, I'm here after a heavy day of working. So <laughs> um, it's really a great ple pleasure and honor for me to be hosted by you, Dr. Sonia, and thanks again for the Global Summit for giving me such opportunity to um, maybe to tell something useful that you can get benefit of it in the future. So thank you again. Uh, if you allow me, I, I, I can screen my, sh my screen sharing. Let's start here. All right, here we go. Here we go. So again, a uh, little bit of myself. My name is Ayman Zagal. I'm a specialist for oral maxillofacial surgery, and I have finished my training program in oral and craniomaxillofacial surgery department of Nasser Institute Hospital for Research and Treatment, um, one of the biggest medical establishment in Cairo. And this is actually the place that we get so far away from dentistry somehow because, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, a pure traumatic center. There was a lot of trauma, dentofacial deformities, resective, reconstructive surgery, and even uh, the, the dental alveolar surgery was something which is rarely to be there. So uh, we really literally get far away from dentistry. And that was the place that um, I developed my skill uh, utilizing many softwares in a digital uh, field, many manufacturing printers as well. So. Uh, this were the environment that I built up my skills in the virtual surgical planning 
and 3D printing. So today I'm going to talk about a virtual surgical planning and 3D printing um, in mandibular reconstruction, uh, utilizing my own way. And I got the honor to represent my country in the uh, World Congress of the International College of Maxillofacial Surgery that was in 2019. And um, I call it a, a new approach for virtual surgical planning and 3D printing in mandibular reconstruction, utilizing the occipital crest as a native midland landmark. Um, so I will go fast to the case report here. Uh, this is Abdul Rahim. He, he was a 16 years old teenager because that was five years ago. <laughs> he's, he's 21 right now. So he was a 16 years old teenager from Gaza Strip. And he um, he got a gunshot in his face in the events that took place in Gaza in 2014. Um, and he underwent a surgical debridement, bullet removal, and a delayed reconstruction that was in Gaza, a reconstruction plate with 2.7 striker type uh, reconstruction plate, apparently under uh, poor facilities, poor equipments, and uh, he got a poor result as well. So he represented to me again after one year in Cairo with this uh, huge disfigurement, palpable plate, keloid tendency, and a functional deficit, which was his main concern as a limited mouth opening deviation to the left side and while opening and um, uh, psychological trauma as well for the patient and for his family members. And, um, you know, a, a sinus uh, problem. There was a lot of uh, bone and teeth fragments in his right sinus as a result of ballistic injury that was need to be addressed uh, at the surgical setting for uh, simultaneously. So uh, initially what I asked the patient to do is um, a CT scan, which is a, a spiral medical CT scan, high resolution with very thin slice thicknesses. So I can get the orientation about uh, the anatomy, the deformity, and of course for uh, surgical planning. And what I found here that um, here's the plate and you can see that the plate is poorly positioned, um, this study is out of the bone, and even uh, uh, the, proximally, it's poorly positioned, and there is no bone grafting, it's only just bridging the gap, and, um, and I give special interest to that field, uh, that's a particular portion of the skull, which is the glenoid fossa and the condyle bearing segment here, and what I found that the condyle has been sacked completely and a counterclockwise fashion of the condyle because apparently under the influence of temporalis muscle, which is bullying, and um, probably also because of uh, mechanical errors that's happened. Because when uh, when we try to to do uh, such surgery conventionally, we are we are doing it uh, through a submandibular approach, which is down there. Try to grasp uh, the proximal segment with a heavy forceps and try to get uh, the condyle back to the to the glenoid fossa. Uh, using our tactile sensation, which is completely blindless. And uh, unless we are opening another approach, which is the preauricular approach, uh, which is not frequently used here. So it's uh, sometimes we will end up with the condyle, which is out of the glenoid completely, and uh, which clarify the functional deficit that the patient may suffer from later on. So I do believe that um, these cases as a straightforward case for, my, for virtual surgical planning, because you can assemble everything behind the screen. You can uh, print out a, a model and bend a plate on the model and try to transfer that particular plate to the patient precisely. And you will get everything back in more favorable position than, uh, than planned, uh, blindly uh, position the segments. So um, what we use, uh, this, is another, this is another view of the, of the mandible, isolated mandible for the same patient. You can see that the, the segment is also rotated medially as well, which is further compl complicated the situation because I think there is um, muscle attachment. I think that uh, this segment is a float, floating segment under the influence of masticator muscles. So it, it, it may, um, it may uh, move uh, in the X, Y, and Z axis. Uh, and that's uh, further complicate the situation uh, in terms of condyle uh, position. So what we used to use here is the mirror image, uh, which is a very useful tool uh, in many softwares. The mirror image, we can mirror the unaffected site to be the to to to, to mirror and to utilize it uh, for production. But our very 
limited experience uh, doing uh, many cases in mirror image uh, gave, us, gave us a clue that it's also unpredictable and sometimes it has its own limitations and shortcomings, especially in the mandibular because the mandible is a dynamic portion of the skull which is, which is uh, different from the zygoma or from the maxilla which, is can, which can be easily mirrored. The mandible uh, still has its, um, its very, uh, very highly characteristics uh, when, when we deal with the uh, mirror image. First of all, I found that, uh, I, or, or I, I, should, I should consider that the facial asymmetry is a norm, and that's especially true uh, in the mandibular reconstruction because the cranium is asymmetry, and if we mirror the mandible to get symmetrical sides, then we will end up with one of the condyle which is seated uh, in improper way because uh, the, the asymmetry of the cranium itself even in, the, in, in, in terms of millimeters. Uh, the second point is that the sagittal plane is hardly get in the mandibular reconstruction because, you know, uh, when we... Against, and this is very sensitive because even one millimeter uh, different in the sagittal plane will be doubled when you mirror image. So the mirror image against a sagittal plane is very sensitive. You need at least three, four points to put your sagittal uh, plane. And what I found that in mandibular reconstruction, especially if the defect has bass by passing the midline, you will not be able to put the sagittal plane on the mandible because um, because of the default because the you lost the point in the chin, so you don't have any reference in the mandible to put your sagittal plane. You 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 just uh, rely on the cranial base. This is the second uh, point, and the third one, which is the highly sensitive one, I highlighted here with the red color. It's that um, when you mirror image something, you need to have a fixed portion that you need to mirror, but the mandible is still movable in both sides. And what I see that uh, when you lost uh, a, a portion of the mandibular body, we lost something called the buttressing effect of the mandible, then the other portion of the, of the mandible will be twisted or torched. So you are actually uh, mirroring a movable part or distorted part. So it's not applicable uh, in, in, in many cases, especially if there is a swelling uh, of uh, if a legion, of osteolytic legion, of, uh, you, will, you will get uh, the, the other portion of the uh, mandible distorted as well. So you cannot rely on that particular portion if you mirror image the mandible. So, so what, I, what, I, what I tried to do here, I, uh, I found that uh, I put 20 cases under study and tried to, uh, to relate the mandible to a more fixed point of the cranial base, which, which is that, uh, the external occipital crest. I found that the external occipital crest is a native midline landmark, so it's always in the midline, it's fixed point in the cranial base, and we can utilize it uh, 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 without mirroring anything. I found that 20 cases uh, between the age of 20 and 45, which is the other sense, I found that these cases, which is which is all which is all traumatic cases of um, mid face and the upper face, so the mandible still intact and has its normal relation to the cranial face. I found that there is an equilateral triangle developed between the gonion angles of the mandible and the external occipital crest in the middle of the crest somehow. Uh, this, that means that our mandible has a harmony between the mandible size and the skull size, which means that when we, when we grow up, the mandible gets bigger and will get um, away from the skull base so that the mandible, the triangle will be uh, maintained in all the sides up to 45 years of age. So, uh, which means that I can, I can utilize this triangle to mirror or to restore everything back without mirroring anything with the inherited um, limitations of the mirror image. Especially if the other portion is distorted, the triangle will restore it uh, as well. So uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is just a theory and I will apply it here. Uh, what's the significance of this triangle? I utilize it here for the mandibular reconstruction. Uh, that's what I'm about to talk here. And you can assess the facial asymmetry cases utilizing this triangle because this limb, the red limb here, is, um, is, should be equal all the time. 
if you uh, if you have a facial asymmetry with uh, hemimandibular elongation, hemimandibular hypertrophy, or a facial micro hemifacial microsomia, you will likely to have one of these limbs get affected. So you will assess a facial asymmetry in a 3D uh, skull. Always, also, there is a chance to assist an obstructive sleep apnea using this triangle because um, I do believe that if these red limbs get closer to the cranium base, the obstructive sleep apnea will get likely because um, the mandible will get uh, closer uh, to the airway. Uh, I never utilize it uh, for obstructive sleep apnea analysis, but uh, I do believe so. And this is a chance for anyone who wanna to apply this. Uh, and feed us back if it's applicable or not. So initially here, because I lost, I'm, I'm talking about three points in the middle of the external occipital crest and the two points of the gonian angles. If you lost the gonian angles as, uh, as a result of ballistic injury here, uh, you need to mirror image just to have anatomical angle, then you can utilize the triangle. But if you, if in many cases, you will have an angle intact, so you can utilize it uh, straightforward case. So I just mirrored image here just to have anatomical uh, angle. Once I, I utilized that triangle here, I found that the, uh, the purple uh, or the violet um, uh, segment of the mandible here, the new mandible, get higher and posterior than, uh, than the native condyle here, which is a more favorable position uh, up in the glenoid fossa. So here is uh, the triangle. I put the triangle back and I found an interesting here in distally, I found an overlapping between the native bone, which is the yellow portion of the mandible and the violet mandible that I intend to print. This overlapping here is the idea behind the whole concepts. I eliminate all the errors that may uh, develop during mirror image, which is uh, uh, I, I also restore the mandible uh, the, the condyle in the other segment, in the other um, left side to, to get much accurate in the glenoid fossa. So now, now I just want to, to print my model, but uh, I need to subtract uh, the new position from the old, from the old native bone, which is um, uh, which using, using some, the so-called subtraction tool. There is a tool in the software, which is called the subtraction tool. And that's, uh, that's a tool that subtract two intersecting object from each other, then you will relate the two objects from uh, each other. Then I subtract the purple part from the yellow portion of the mandible, then I, I will have a flush border that I can print out and print my plate on it. So this is um, the segment of the mandible. I, I just need to give three notifications here. This is an acrylic, um, acrylic printable uh, material. Uh, first of all, always remember that you can print the whole mandible and the whole skull and the vertebrae and the pelvis as well. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, um, you know, it's uh, um, cost effective for the patient to print a segment of, uh, of the mandible, the useful segment of the mandible that you need to bend your plate on. This is the first notification. The second one, of course, nowadays we can print uh, uh, the plate itself as a patient specific plates and patient specific or customized plates, uh, which is much more accurate than bending uh, a plate on a model, but it's also uh, very, very expensive. And uh, also you can utilize the triangle in the same way uh, using uh, the customized plates or implants. Uh, the third one is uh, that this is the most sensitive uh, step in the whole procedure because you need to transfer the intimate contact between the plate and the model to the patient. Otherwise, you did nothing in terms of a uh, new position of the condyles. So uh, some, some surgeons prefer to do the so-called uh, hot transfer guide, and that's basically by uh, putting uh, the plate on the model and take three successive holes and drill these holes uh, through the plate and the model. Then they take out the plate out and they put a strip of acrylic over these holes and they drill them back. Then you will have a strip of acrylic with a holes that corresponding to the hole of the metallic plate. Then you can autoclave it and put it in the autoclave and put it in the patient uh, during the surgical sitting 
and you can drill these holes in the patient and the plate will be fit on that corresponding holes. That transfers accurate uh, position of the plate on the model to the patient. This is very precise and um, I like it. But for simplicity, I utilize here the flash boarding degree. I just memorize the position of the plate uh, on the model by flushing the borders uh, below that plate. And I try to get this plate back to the patient in the same way, uh, inferiorly, posteriorly, and anteriorly. So I hopefully to get everything back to its normal position, especially the condyles. So um, this is the actual surgery, and this is a, a low submandibular approach. I utilize it for uh, keloid revision. If you, if, you, if you see the keloid up, the surgeon may understand me. And uh, I try to, uh, of course, I removed the previous plate and I try to put my new plate with flush borders. So uh, to get uh, everything back to more favorable position. And I take um, an anterior iliac bone graft non-vascularized from the non-dominant leg, the left one. And I augment uh, uh, the, I bridging the gap simultaneously with a bone graft. And this is the post-operative CT. You can see here the mandible with the flush borders, much more, much better than the previous one, posteriorly, inferiorly, and anteriorly. And there is bone graft. And we did uh, a Caldwell lock operation to take out the tooth fragments in the right maxilla. And of course, you can see here is the bone grafting is overfilled, the segment, and it's time to, um, to see what's going on with the, with the triangle that I utilized in the first place. I see that the triangle has been restored in 99% of accuracy. The mandible gets restored in a symmetrical way, interestingly. And uh, even the coron in the coronal uh, uh, view of the skull here, you can find that the condyle has been restored perfectly. Even the intergonial distance, which is highly sensitive to the to one of the uh, triangle limbs here with the intergonial distance uh, that we can utilize and which is one of the most hard position to restore uh, in terms uh, of um, gonion angles uh, projection. Uh, actually, I just want to say about uh, some geometrical point of view, um, because I do believe that the, con the, the, the gonion angle here is the most sensitive point of the whole complex, because it's the most far point for the condyle. When, wh whenever you are uh, moving the condyle in the X, Y, and Z, the most sensitive point here is the gonion angle. So. In geometrical point of view, if you have an A point, which is the, a, the condyle or the CO point, and the uh, gonion angle, which is the GO point, which is the P point, and they are linked together with the, with the ramus, then you, when, when you move one, one, one point, the other will, will move simultaneously. And when, when you position the gonion angle to more favorable position, utilizing the triangle, you will find that the condyle has been restored perfectly in the glenoid fossa. And you will take all that, uh, all consideration about the X, Y, and Z axis because the triangle will utilize all these. What I found also interesting here is putting the patient in a centric relation or centric occlusion during data acquisition does not affect uh, the triangle because uh, the point in the external occipital crest here will, meet, will be moved along the crest uh, together with the occlusion. And even at the posterior facial height, which is highly variable between the individual, does not affect that at all because also it will be symmetrical to the other side and uh, nothing, nothing will be changed. The triangle will be maintained all the way and in all uh, the, this uh, age group of patients. So this is the patient um, two days after the operation and this is two months after the operation. And I still have a contact with the patient. Uh, it's like five years ago. And uh, today I'm going to, to, to do another uh, research about um, amyloblastoma cases. Uh, how, how can I utilize the triangle in such resection and reconstruction cases? Uh, the patient here is still have no functional deficit at all. He has great opening and no deviation at all. He got uh, great uh, symmetrical to the other side 
and uh, the problem is uh, eliminated completely in terms of functional deficit that the patient came uh, with. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zagal, for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, this sounds a very promising um, work that you have developed. Uh, I particularly actually happen to work with um, sleep apnea disorder yeah. too. And yes, I'm, you... I'm also a part, uh, a part of a Palestinian Academy of Artificial Pain and Dental Sleep Medicine. We, uh, we didn't mention that, but uh, I am also a partner of, of this academy. So I'm working also with a sleep apnea and sleep medicine. Yeah. That's fantastic because I, I'm also with the Bucomaxillofacial Prosthetic Reconstruction in Sao Paulo. It sounds like we're going to be able to do a lot of uh, cooperation work together. Thank you. Um, Thank you. One thing uh, it was interesting that you mentioned, we work very closely with um, a, a, a multidisciplinary uh, yeah. team of professionals. Yes. And we regularly send, like, regularly send our patients to chiropractitioners yeah. where we measure exactly that. Um, we measure exactly that uh, when you showed the symmetry, but the, the, the the position of the tri the base of this skull in yeah. relation, for instance, with this, the cervical vertebras. And many times, because they do, a, they end up compensating because of the craniofacial growth uh, yeah. asymmetry many times, even in normal um, patients that have not grown, grown properly for some uh, dysfunctional yeah. reason. And we find it, Many times that they have those cervical, uh, um, the C one, C two, kind of actually distorted. And I noticed in your in your slide, your your first slide on this, that it was kind of rotated, and that was very easy for us to see because many times you have to try to to really be sure that you are in the midline before you can interpret the position of the, 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 the cervical bones there. And I think it's, 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 it's going to be huge. Uh, it's an area I would like to discuss with you afterwards. Yeah. But I have a few questions uh, right. about the, um, actually the uh, reconstruction itself. All right. Um, I know there's been uh, an evolution in recent years with uh, 3D fabrication techniques yep. for many applications in biomedical area, areas uh, of research, such as prosthetics in plants, organ printing, and um, scaffoldings for uh, tissue engineering, engineering uh, applications for reconstruction of yep. special structure like yes. there's been a lot of investigation also for reconstruction of the mandible using scaffolding. Yes. Um, can you tell us, our listeners, uh, what's the current clinical um, available scenario mm -hmm. uh, for organ printing or like a structure printing in bucomaxillofacial reconstruction? And what are the li current limitations? Uh, great question. Uh, I doubt if there is someone who can answer that correctly or perfectly because uh, this uh, field of uh, research is still an in infancy and still underdeveloped. But uh, I read a lot about type printing. It's, it's great and a huge um, fertilized area of research. And, uh, you know, it's a dream for us as a maxillofacial surgeon to have the chance to print a nose or ear with a native natural, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really a, a, a huge, huge dream for every plastic and maxillofacial surgery. Um, actually, what I'm, uh, what I'm about to, do, to talk about in, in, in the field of bioprinting is, um, you know, uh, I, still, I still believe in, in, the, in the scaffolding uh, based printing because they are printing a biocompatible plastic material and they put the bio inks inside uh, layers, layer by layer to develop uh, an organ, which is 
like a kidney or, or liver, mm -hmm. something like, uh, or, or I think uh, an organobo company has the lead um, and they are the pioneers. Uh, they, uh, they develop uh, human blood vessels uh, in 2009, as I, as I recall. I don't know, I don't know if I'm, I'm right or not, but um, the pie printing nowadays, it's something that everyone has to hear about and to talk about because uh, we are at the age of uh, printing uh, from stem cells and from bio inks like uh, BLA and BGA and uh, HMMA, something that's called bio inks that's uh, highly variable between uh, the countries and uh, industries. Yes, that's nice. So thank you. Um, just following from that question, yeah. uh, how do you feel this is? Uh, how do you think the, this um, technique of reconstruction? I mean, the yeah. current one that you presented here, and yeah. any future. Uh, promising 3D printed structures that we can do like using scaffoldings or 3D printers with cell cultures that they are doing tissue engineering. Um, the affordability for low-income countries, I mean, is this going to take a long time to be a reality in low-income countries before uh, do you see that as a very expensive reproducible technology? Yeah, this is um, uh, this is a community question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not really medical, but uh, I do believe that uh, it's going so fast. So maybe one day we will find uh, that there is a breakthrough news about the pie printing. Uh, actually, I, I used um, a milling bone grafting, uh, sometimes customized bone blocks which is milled under, uh, you know, under metallic machines and which is, uh, which is also uh, an autograph uh, by some companies that made a customized or patient specific bone, but this is not related to pie printing. It's also bone grafting, but uh, patient specific bone grafting. So uh, I use this, but um, uh, I, uh, I feel that we need to go to pie printing in, 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 in patient reconstruction because it's, uh, it carries a lot of promises in, in the field of the virtual surgical planning and uh, pie printing in the facial area, soft tissue and hard tissue as well. Yes, no, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I've, I've seen the, the, the sad uh, repercussion this has in the self-esteem of patients. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. probably why I'm so passionate about aesthetics yeah. and helping these people to it's build up, back yeah. their yeah. Their uh, self esteem and is is uh, sadly and we still have we still lack of it here in in our area, uh, but uh, we need to to go far uh, to see what's the what the world hold and what's what's going on out there. I, I think there's a lot of difference and a lot of uh, advances here there. Yeah, my I think one of the, cons the concerns I have because I lived in different continents and. Yeah. is that even though we might have something really nicely available in like the first world, sometimes it takes so long for it to become available. Yeah. Uh, yeah I yeah, mean, I, not available. I mean, available could be immediate, but affordable to yeah, affordable countries. Yeah, affordable is another story. Affordable, yeah. that was the word I was looking for. To yeah. countries that also need so much and probably even many that it's more because like you just showed that's what about I Gaza mentioned early. They yes, so that's what I mentioned research. early in my in my presentation. I thought I, I, I just said that uh, the customized implants is, is, uh, is very cost, uh, is highly cost for the patient, yes. but it gives much more accurate and much more predictability in terms of accuracy, safety, and uh, a lot of things. There is no donor side morbidity. The, it's, it's, uh, it has a, a lot of advantages, but it's, the problem is the cost. Yeah. Uh, so now I, I, I don't know if there is anybody uh, any more questions, but uh, tell me how did you start uh, your interest in this area? Yeah, uh, basically uh, I love um, I love uh, manipulating things behind the screen. Uh, I do a lot of uh, you know Photoshop uh, workflow, and uh, I love being in intimate contact with my with my machines, my laptops, my uh, you know. 
uh, I love these. And if I get the chance, I will be an engineering, not, not a dentist. <laughs> but in uh, such technology, because it gives me the chance to work um, much better in terms of accuracy, safety, predictability. And I love the patient education and the patient excitement and the patient engagement uh, in the workflow. They, they are engaged totally uh, in the virtual field because they see, they feel, and they predict uh, much more uh, because uh, you know the patient cannot uh, read the X-ray uh, that we can read, but he can feel the STL model behind it. You know, this is what uh, this is this is the idea behind uh, what I like to do and what I love to do. So you get them involved in the whole process, and you yes, show yes, them exactly. the, the... He can he can also. Uh, recognize the difference before and after everything. Today we are talking about the face scanning uh, in, in, in the facial aesthetic surgery. Even if there is a minor alteration in the nose shape, in the nose shape, or even the poros, you know, the machinery can tell us where is the problem and how to correct it uh, as a barometers. Uh, and we always said that uh, when, it, when it's a matter of number, there is no place for errors because the machinery cannot tell, tell us uh, something which is, which is wrong unless yes. we are putting the data in a, in a wrong manner. So uh, I think that the technology will give us much more accuracy in, in, the, coming day, in the coming days and years. Uh, is this uh, tech technique, I mean, is it normally the, you normally do, I guess, in a like a hospital setting? I'm not talking the surgery itself. I mean, do you yeah. get this kind of patient coming to your, like a clinical uh, uh, actually, uh, a, a dental office, an ordinary I office? I am more in uh, dental alveolar surgery now because uh, most, of, most of our dental daily practice is a dental alveolar surgery, guided implantology, sorry. And uh, I utilized um, uh, cutting guides for harvesting um, on uh, uh, not, also, not, not only an implant guides, also a bone harvesting guide, sinus lip guide I did it twice, and even uh, crown lengthening guides. And uh, it's much more than uh, only uh, reconstruction and resection. We can, we can analyze, we can plan, we can print, we can do a lot of things. Uh, so in our dental daily practice, we use uh, the 3D printing uh, even every day. So uh, the, uh, I, I do believe that the printer will be uh, will be in every uh, clinic uh, just after five years from now. So it's the time to 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 know how to manipulate, how to how to work with such technology from now. Right. Yes. So you do uh, general dentistry too, or these days only? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing only facial. dental alveolar. Yes, only dental alveolar surgery. I have I have my team, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, I do believe in a multidisciplinary because yes. um, it's like ten years that uh, that uh, that I I left uh, endodontic treatment or restorative dentistry. Uh, I have I'm not familiar with the recent advances in, in these sciences, so. I left all these behind, and I'm I know what wh where I'm going uh, in digital uh, surgery and virtual planning. That's nice. I think there is a tendency in the world you can see that coming uh, yeah. towards multidisciplinary um, health care, really. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we have to start time to start changing our names from dentist to like sounds like a mechanic of the teeth to uh, craniofacial doctors, right? Because yeah. you don't want to just open the, the, the mouth of the patient and look, look at straight teeth. You have to start watching the patient and they walk in through the door and their posture, yeah, are they that's, that's absolutely right. lopsided absolutely. or not? And how well, are their shoulders, how is their head? And then yes. the symmetry of the face. And the last thing I say is like, the last thing is the zoom of the camera into their <laughs> mouth. Right. And then you look at teeth. <laughs> that yes. you, then you can call yourself a doctor. And then if you have to have this uh, engagement with other doctors, yeah, you have to work as a team. We, we cannot just think of two. Yeah, I, I refer a lot of cases uh, because I think that it's out of the scope that I am interested, in. and I may miss uh, misdiagnose the case. 
So I do believe in in the specialities. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the Global Summit Institute is doing a wonderful job Thank too you. in collecting the, they're collecting uh, doctors together and try to, to promote this inter interdisciplinary uh, doctor approach, which is very nice. And I think this is going yeah. to get Thank very, you. very big. Um, well, uh, is anything else you'd like to, to add to this? You have still a few more minutes. If you like to expand a bit more, how many, uh, when you do, I don't know how many patients have you done so far with this technique yeah. and uh, with this technique using the triangle measurement, which I thought yes. was really amazing. And my question to you is, using that, do you ever get, uh, and how much do you get like a cantilever that end up having one, con uh, one body of the mandible a bit longer than the other? Uh, no, it's so, uh, as, the, I, the as I just said, yeah, as I just said, for, for drawing a mm. triangle, you need three points, right? Yeah. Then like, occipital the crest is always in the midline. You just said that uh, sometimes it's not in the midline. I, I don't, I don't think so, because uh, even in dentofacial deformities, even the syndromatic cases, the cranium, the cranial base is still intact. Uh, I think there's a, a posterior plagiocephaly syndromes uh, in the cranial facial era. And I think um, I, I never assist the, uh, the external, external occipital crest there, but I, I do believe that um, the external occipital crest is always the midline, uh, especially in the traumatic cases that I at least uh, working with. And the gonion angles, if you have the, the both gonion angles, I, th I try to, to put a parameters in the, in the laptop so, we, so the, the, the laptop can memorize where is the points and he will develop the triangle alone, like an auto triangle. So if, if that's happened, then both condyles will be restored immediately because the functional absolutely deficit. accurate the same size yeah if if the condi gonion angle still have its relation right and in such in such case we i don't have an, an anatomical angle i i restored it but mm. in most of the traumatic cases and resection cases the gonion angle will be will be intact that's uh, that's the theory because even um, if you if you if you did uh, imaginary section cases of OKC or mid-blastoma or osteomyelitis, whatever, when there is a lot of buttressing of the inferior border of the mandible, the both angles will be will be there. So you can restore everything back. Uh, uh, I tried it many times. That's wonderful. I'd like to see some of your cases. So uh, if you if you have a patient say who had a gunshot or or for some uh, uh, yeah. neoplasia, have lost this gonial angle. How do you figure the point out? Yeah, I have. I have Can to restore you... it. Yes, it's it's not applicable <laughs> because uh, at least you need the three points. But um, yes. uh, at and least uh, is it a, with the compute like this system you developed? Is it able to kind of do a a good guess um, work? What I did here in the in, in, in this case. Uh, I did a mirror image just to have the anatomical angle. Oh. Then uh, the anatomy, the new anatomical angle will be flushed with the with the ramus. So I will be able to memorize where is the where the future angle will be. This is just just um, this is a special case actually. It's not it's not uh, it's not every case that we have interfaced in, in daily practice. But uh, this is a very challenging case one. But the condyle, if you if you if you see the coronal section at the end, was great, was very very great. Yes, it was it was beautiful. Mm. Mm. It's very exciting that more people are interested in this uh, facial really? craniofacial reconstruction because uh, now uh, that's the other thing. Uh, there is an increase in oral cancer worldwide, and I myself yeah. have treated many patients having put. Uh, Place to obturators uh, when they 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 have to do surgery to remove cancer up, from the palate, date, no, but... and etc. But with prosthetics, 
but I, they are losing a lot of uh, uh, bones with removal of oral cancer. Uh, so this area is, I think it's just going, the demand for a solution that's appropriate like you proposing is, yeah. is going mean, to be higher each time. Ah, you, you mean uh, the, the cancer ablation surgery that we interface daily in the mid phase or? No, uh, the, the, the ones I, uh, I, we used to work with, we removed large parts of mandible, of maxilla yeah. due to, to, to loss, yeah. uh, due to cancer. So the reconstruction, but with 3D printing and many times, like I said, if they lose pieces of- yeah, the sorry, I read a lot about, about uh, he heavy reconstruction uh, in the facial area. And uh, I do believe in the cutting guides that we can utilize uh, when we take a harvesting bone from the, from the fibula, from the scapula, from the anterior iliac, uh, because uh, there is nothing like um, the autograft that the patient have. Um, but, the, but the field of uh, alloplastic uh, reconstruction of uh, you know, metallic or nowadays we are talking about the peak reconstruction as a biocompatible material, uh, it's promising, and uh, the, the major advantage of these uh, things that you don't have to open another surgery. But it's still there is a deficiency in the soft tissue. There is a deficiency in uh, there is a lack of uh, literature support about uh, see that is, uh, such things. But uh, there is a lot of things that uh, succeed and passed in a great way. Uh, so, uh, especially in the maxilla, in the maxillary area, um, uh, I think brown, brown classification, class two and three, I, thought, I, I saw many cases treated in, in, in prosthetic customized implant, uh, and it works well with integrated implant as well. And uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm talking about. It's, great. it's, great. it's really great. And also the bioprinting uh, carries a promising uh, in the future if we can restore the soft tissue and the bone simultaneously, wow, that would be great. Yes, that's fantastic. Okay, so is any anything else you would like to leave a word? Um, uh, I just wanna say it's really a great pleasure and honor for me to be with you, Dr. Sonia. And uh, thanks again for the Global Summit uh, for giving me an opportunity and looking forward to meet all of you, uh, literally, I'm, 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 not, I'm just, <laughs> And soon enough, we're gonna meet uh, uh, maybe in the DDS mm -hmm. and uh, afterward. And thank you so much. Thank you, we really appreciate it. And thank, thank you. you very much for participating. Thank you, um, And um, thank you all the, the listener for this participating in the, another webinar. And remember that there are li the links below that you can get in and register to get your CE. And you. be ready because we'll be another webinar soon this morning. So thank you, Dr. Zagal. We'll thank talk you. again. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye -bye.